Audio Frontier. This is Football Daft with Stephen Purden. Midfield dynamo and average actor. Chris Toll. Target man. Suspicious character. And... Hey, the top end of Stevenson, Grado! Right, now it's time to welcome to Football Daft a Danish international who has played in the Bundesliga, the English Premiership and of course right here in Scotland. With over 100 appearances for Rangers, he is now a coach at the club. Please welcome Peter Lovinkrantz. Hey, what's happening, Peter? How are you doing, guys? Good, mate. How are you good. coping, big man? You scan up? Are you good? No, I'm okay. I'm actually enjoying it, to be fair. I enjoy being home and uh, spend time with the kids and stuff, so it's quite good. I've got a busy schedule when I'm coaching, so it's, uh, it's quite nice. Aye, to be fair, I'd be... Who what, man? Going into Murray Park every day and all, right enough. Oh, can you go up my Toe, try hard a wee bit of professionalism in this interview here. Come on. Listen, mate, the professionalism's out the windy. I'm oh, sorry. This is a really big name for us in the show here. Come on. I know it is. I know it is. And listen, Peter, it's an honour to have you on, mate. But listen, you're right. not getting away scot free. I'll tell you that right now. That's all right. Don't worry about it. I can take it. <laughs> Just ignore him. You'll get with you, <laughs> Right, we're not talking at the one time here. Right, easy. Right, come on. Easy, easy, easy. Right, who's asking the first question? You date, Gredo. Since you were talking. Right, okay. Okay, <laughs> okay. Peter. Yes. Peter, how's it going? How are you doing? You're feeling well. So, obviously, we're all stuck in the house. Yep. You're the Rangers reserve coach. How are you keeping in contact with the club? How does it work? Is it stuff like this? Are you on Skype? Are you on Zoom? Are you Snapchatting folk? Are you TikToking the players? How are you keeping uh, that communication up during this period where everybody's in the house in lockdown? Um, we actually got a really good setup with the club. We are doing Zoom interviews, uh, not interviews, two, two Zoom chats, and uh, we speak to the players that way. We had the catch up, doing going through programs and stuff like that they need to do, and um, we can still check their well beings and how they are, and uh, we do phone calls to make sure they're okay, and um, they feel like a well being in the morning, so we know if they're feeling okay, if there's any problems or whatever it is. Um, and of course, they got the things they need to do to keep themselves fit. So we yeah, are we're on top of them, and we're trying to communicate as much as we can. I so uh, are the players like maybe like filming ourselves doing keepy ups and press ups and and stuff like that, and then sending it <laughs> into you just taking a. <laughs> is that, like, how does it work? Does it? No, they're not not doing that though. They're not videoing themselves in any way like that. But we got kind of we got stats on them where we, through these apps where we can follow them with when they're do, out doing jogs or doing runs. They get programs from our sports science guys and, you know, they, they record how, how much they're doing, how many Ks they're running and all the rest of it so we can keep track of what they're doing and if they're up to scratch and keeping fit. So um, that's kind of how we, how, we, how we know what they're doing. Peter, do you think right. that's challenge, great old man? You know what I mean? Keeping the ball up and all that. <laughs> Say that Peter. again, Bobby. They're not doing like the Kevin Thompson challenge, keeping the ball against the wall or that and sending it into Lovingcrans. Is that good, Gaffer? Aye. <laughs> well, well, should I tell you, my, my, my girlfriend, she uh, she used to play for Rangers when she was younger and they had to, like, um, you know, record themselves in the gym and, you know, just to make sure there's evidence that they were keeping up the training and stuff like that. Aye, aye, that and I just wondered if that's in the gym. <laughs> I say, is I right? That's why they were getting filmed in the gym. <laughs> Chris, throw up. Throw up, Chris. Right, Peter. Peter, so, I've got a Peter, somebody else. Right, so do you think any of the players have tied the wee machine to their dug and just let their dug out in the garden and run about for a couple of hours so it looks as if they're out doing a bit of exercise? No, I don't think so, because some of the things they're doing, I don't even think the dog could do it, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at some of the kilometres there, they're covering some of the guys, and it's, uh, it's quite a fair distance, so um, I don't think so. Is he talking about dogs, right, it brings me back to the picture that you posted of your dog on Twitter, saying, <laughs> or, and, and the, guy, the guy replied to you, obviously, without looking at the photo, yeah. saying, oh, that's amazing, I hope your son grows up to, to play for Rangers the same as his dad. Yeah, and it was actually your dog you were talking about. That's right. It was because I put it in saying my wee boy turned 12. And he, he was my wee boy, my dog. I lost him a few years ago now. But he's uh, 
he, he was kind of like my boy, so I have two girls, so he was my boy. <laughs> so that was why. <laughs> yeah. Peter, how long did it take for you? How long did it take for you to get that accent, man? There's a there's a number of years. There's like you, Albert, we natural, and there's they they end up just getting this accent. It's hilarious. They can a mix a Danish and as 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 we told says before you come on. What was it? Danish, a cross between Danish and Deniston, your, your accent? <laughs> um, nah, but of course, in Denmark, you know, if you, if you go to Denmark, everybody kind of speaks English. Everybody has to school English over there. And they, because everything in Denmark is not dubbed, like, for example, Germany and France and Italy, they type of countries dub everything over. So movies and everything is in their language. Uh, where Denmark, we don't do that. Denmark has normal American movies, TV shows, just with Danish subtitles. So I learned kind of the normal... English and had in school, of course, as a young age, since I was about seven. So you had the basics, but when I came to Glasgow, it was, I think it took me four years to understand the kit man, Jimmy Bell. You know, he was, uh, <laughs> it was ridiculous. It wasn't until I started watching Still Game and Tune It Fast, I got it, you know, when I was, uh, <laughs> that was how I kind of got my accent, you know, I started watching them, especially Still Game, I absolutely love Still Game, so. Uh, all the, what all the Sorry? You don't watch River City, no? Nah, I missed that big man. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> See, if you ever do watch it, mate, there's, there's, there's these eight episodes in 2015 that blow you away, mate. Eight episodes, there's a guy in it called Buster. <laughs> he plays a wrestler. He's shit hot. Go back and try and find them, mate. You maybe get them on uh, Pirate Bay or something like that. Maybe it's you, some one of the fire sticks. Tr- catch, catch the episodes. You nearly got the show so I've got I've got a question for you here. Um, it comes it comes with a friend of mine, Coach Trip. Um, he's saying, is it true that you used Thanks to get commission? Much. Is it true that you used to get commission on the letter and put on the shirts? And is it true that Alex Ray was raging at you? Commission. That's <laughs> brilliant. That's brilliant. No, I've never heard anything about that at all. <laughs> See, because that's, that, that's funny, mate. To I remember that, but as a young boy, I always wanted Van Bronckhurst in the back of my tap, but there was no way I was uh, I, 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 I was spending all that money. So, But you know what? It made it even better. The best thing that happened was for when Flo came. Flo, FLO, he was only about £6 to get. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, as, as you know, I'm a Celtic fan, and I couldn't afford Jan Venegura Hesselink. The name cost me every <laughs> strip. I know. I had to get the last. I had to get the last few letters down on my socks. <laughs> Just on the back of your tap, Link. <laughs> <laughs> Just on the back of your tap, Link. Yeah, <laughs> so Peter, how did how did how did you get to the Angels? How did your move to Scotland come about? Um, it was actually quite interesting because I was I was a lot of clubs in Denmark at that point uh, when I was playing in Denmark. Um, I was a couple. I think about twelve club, clubs was looking at me the last three games of the season, and it was the likes of Valencia and Inter Milan and um, these type of clubs and, and Newcastle and that. And then I was actually in negotiations with Newcastle. Newcastle was flown over to speak to me and my dad, my agent in Denmark, and uh, we agreed to go to go and watch, like go to see the place at St James Park and all that. Um, and on two days, no, was it the day before we were going to fly? My agent phoned me. And I'd go to Glasgow first and then go to Newcastle because uh, Rangers wants to speak to me as well. Um, and I actually went to Rangers and David Murray um, and Brian Loudrop had a big play in me kind of signing there, right, right there and then. And I ended up never going to Newcastle to see the plays and they were absolutely raging. But <laughs> further than the line, I actually went, of course, anyway. But it's, uh, I was very, very close to go there before uh, Rangers, yeah. So, as t- Peter, as you know, obviously, Scottish football's got a rich history of Danish players. We've had, like, Thomas Gravison, Martin V. Korst, um, we've had, obviously, Brian Loudrop, yourself, um, Mark Reaper as well. Um, is, how's your Tommy getting on? Yeah, my brother. Aye. Yeah, he's doing all right. He's fine, yeah. He's doing okay. Is it, like, see, when, see, when you signed for Rangers and he signed for St. Johnston, was yeah. he a bit raging? No, he actually signed for St. Johnson two weeks before me, before I signed for Rangers. So it was also a big play in why I signed for Rangers because I knew I only had him on like an hour away um, and he what just had that? a play and stuff. So it was having family close by. But I was just moving to my mum's house to move to Rangers. So 
it was a big move for me. So to have my brother that close was was quite important. So. It would have been it would have been a comfort as well, you know, especially coming to a new country. Yeah. Um, yeah. And was, what was it like when you played against them? Was it? <laughs> I, 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 you know, people have said, I played against my brother since I was five years old. You know, I mean, uh, he's been two footing me in the back garden. You know, I mean, from then on. So it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was quite used to these type of things. But also in the pitch, we played a full pitch. We were completely opposite side of the pitch. I was right. up front. He was also the up front of the other side. So it was uh, we were playing not kind of up against each other, but um, it's, 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 of course it's a special moment for my mum and dad as well to be able to see me and my, the, their two sons play against each other it was quite special especially in the Premier League and yourself yeah. playing for such a huge club as Rangers but yeah. um, after you went to, after you left Rangers um, you went to Newcastle what was it was the was there a huge like culture shock there going from the Scottish Premier League to the English Premier League because I know that a lot of people say that the Scottish games are a lot faster. So I would think with the game being a wee bit slower and you having the, the pace that you had, you would have adapted to the English game really well. Yeah, it, it suited me really well. But I have to say, going from Rangers then to Schalke, then to Newcastle, had that two and a half years in Germany in between, um, also gave me a different culture with them because it was a very much like a counter-attack in football in Germany uh, compared to the physical side in the, in, in Scotland. Um, and that really suited me well as well in Germany. And then going from that to Newcastle, where um, it was a completely different bet, where you get more time on the ball, it's more tactical, I would say, uh, in that way, also suited me really well. So it didn't, it was not like I looked at it as going, or I had to try to find my feet or anything. It was just a matter of going and enjoying and trying to expose what, you, how, what you're good at and, and go and get that planted as quick as you can. And that's what, kind of what I did. I tried to do it as quick as I could, trying to get used to the tempo in the, in the football. Yeah. So I like the way you've just jumped there, uh, for, you know, playing at Rangers and signing for Newcastle, missing out. Uh, <laughs> come on, so Scottish Cup final 2002. We just going to ding that for you, Tom, mate, aye? That's what I was going to say there. Well, you know, as I, as I said to you a couple of weeks ago, that's fresh in my memory because me and Barry sat and watched it the last time he was up <laughs> in my car. And, uh, do you know, Peter... I I watched that game with my mates and it was a it was a mixed household. It was Rangers fans up the stairs and Celtic fans down the stairs. Oh. And the Celtic fans had our 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 uh, TV was a wee bit quicker than upstairs, so I knew that you had scored before they celebrated. So I ran out the house <laughs> so that I didn't need to listen to them. But that diving header at the death, man, you scumbaggy. Yeah, that was one of the best days of my life, man. One of the best days of my life. What a goal. Why just talk us through that goal? Just talk us through it. Um, yeah, you know, I, I remember the game. You know, I was actually had, having a really good game, but it was also seen playing from a neutral point of view. It was a fantastic football game. You know, I mean, the, going back and forward, Celtic going up twice, and us coming back, and it looked like going into extra time. It was just back and forward, back and forward. But we were playing really well. Um, and at the point going back behind twice when we were playing well it was tough. Um, and I remember after we went after Barry's free kick and we got back to it, um, it was one of the ones where towards the end, of, to be fair, I remember Alex McLeish putting on, I think it was Avalatsa. I've been playing up front the whole game and scoring goals and, and, and looking good and all the rest of it. And then he puts him on and put me wide. I was raging. <laughs> um, and I was, so I was thinking, I'm not having this. So he put me out wide and then with the last couple of minutes to go, kind of the way the build up was in the game. Uh, seeing an opportunity, I thought, nah, I'm just going to get myself in there because Avalanche was a wee bit deeper than me. So I thought, he'll cover me there and I'll just run in. And then when Neil McCann threw that ball in, I thought, nah, I'm just going for this. And then, what yeah, a cross it was. Up, so what a cross. It was an unbelievable cross. Perfect. Um, so it was just a matter of trying to get it on target. I actually thought I missed it and I hit it down in the ground. When I was falling down rolling, it looked like it's going to bounce over. And it wasn't until I came round from a roll and I looked up and I seen it bouncing down. Right off. Right, on you go out to the fans. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, get over the fans. To be fair, it must have been quite bittersweet for Neil McCann delivering the cross that lost the cup final for his schoolboy heroes. Peter, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just ignore him. Just ignore him. Aye. Yeah. I can't remember that must have been a... Cr- was a park head, no, to win the title. Is that not right? Yeah, I don't know. I can't remember that. Aye. 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 <laughs> He, he played brilliant that day. He played brilliant that day. So you think that was a career highlight, Peter, that goal? Um, yeah, looking back, you know, I mean, see at the time when it, when it happened, I was about 23 years old and, you know, I was young and I'd only been there for three years. And it wasn't until 
afterwards we've seen how, how what it kind of meant to the players and that's kind of how we realised that year for me you know, scoring five goals against Celtic in one season and, and seeing what that meant to everybody and all that was what realised for me how big it actually was um, and you know a lot of people don't know this but I was actually me and my dad were Rangers fans because my dad used to come over and watch uh, Gascoigne and Brian Lowder because of Brian Lowder watching them and Joking. with my mum and that so they, so they were so he always came home and said, oh, I want you to play in Scotland. And I was like, nah, no, nah, I don't want but so we've always followed Rangers since my Brian Loudrop and that. So it was a big deal for me to go and play there in the end, you know. I mean, it's for my dad, it meant a lot to my dad as well. But um so I was actually a Rangers fan, but didn't know how big it was until you actually score against Celtic and something that last minute winner like that is just now the stories are here from what it meant to people and all the rest of it. It's just special, it's it's unbelievable. But I would say that's one of my best highlights because how much it meant to the club and that. But for me, scoring in the Champions League uh, for Rangers, my first goal against Stuttgart and, and also then in the last 16 against Villarreal and stuff like that, these type of things was what I dreamt about when I was a wee boy, you know, being able to play at that stage and scoring in that stage was, that was special for me, really, really special as well. So these are the kind of moments that, was, that means a lot to me. I remember your goal against Porto, that was a great goal too. The yeah, night, night, yeah. Oh man, the ball just bounced there and you think ten and go it. And then obviously that season, how how did that feel that season? Because domestically we were struggling, but in Europe yeah. we were flying. And we maybe should have went through against Villarreal when we went earlier. You scored there there, and then you're thinking we're gonna go Chris Boyd missed an absolute sitter. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I still can't yeah. believe he missed that. But how was uh, that season? How did it feel? Um yeah, there was a there was like it was a tough season because like you say, we were struggling domestically, but uh, in Champions League, for some reason, we were, we were clicking and it was working for us and we were doing really well, um, especially the Villarreal game. I remember, to be fair, the home game against Villarreal, we were getting absolutely pumped, really. They were, they were, the Kelman was incredible. And um, and um, we, I think we were lucky to get away with that draw at home, I would say, looking looking back at it. But over there, we were a better team. You know, I mean, we were... We were much better over there, and we were. I think it suited us with a smaller pitch because we could actually get right in about it and get after them and that, and give them getting time to play. Um, and like you say, going one 0 up and looking good, and even though when they came back, that Chris Boyd, you would have put your hoods on him scoring that. I, know. And, you I know, still can't believe it. Even when I talk about it, I still of, can't believe it. One of the best goal scorers, you know, in the Scottish football is to miss something like that in a big, big moment like that was uh, I was hard one to take. It's been so close and also see how well they did. They went to the semi-finals or something that year, I think. The, and, you know, I mean, the show told maybe we could have actually done. So, yeah, it was, it was a bit, it was a gotten one, gotten feeling and they're not going it's through. A, it's a great Villarreal team as well. Yeah, it was really, 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 he was at not the game over there. He wasn't as good as the one at Ibrox. He was incredible. He was just dictating the game. He was controlling that game. He was brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, he was, man. Honest to God, what a football. Yeah, very good. But I mean, uh, Peter, you played. You played with some great, great players at Ibrox. Is there any players in particular you, you trained with and you thought, wow, he is. He he's great to play alongside. Is there anything that stuck in your mind? I mean, <laughs> I always one of the ones that comes to this to my mind first. You know, I mean, one that meant a lot to me was was uh, Arthur Newman was one of the one he helped me so much settling in with the, on on the pitch because he just looked after me in that left wing because I was I was a striker getting papped out on the left wing where I'd never played really, um, and he helped me so much settling in out there to try and figure out my game and um, but I was there was a few names you know I, mean, I can't even just pick one you know Barry Ferguson. The way he trained, the way he played, you know, was was incredible. He was an unbelievable player. Moaning at Moaning at on the pitch, <laughs> you know, honestly, he didn't give the ball. He was raging, <laughs> but you you learn to manage that and learn to kind of know what he's like. And he just kind of he's just that passionate. But he was some player, and to play alongside him was brilliant. Um, but Avalazzi, Michael Moles, I loved Michael. You know, I mean, how good he was when I played with him, and that was even before that was after he got injured. How, how good he would have been. Before that, it was, mm-hmm. I mean, he was some player, but some guy as well. There's too many names. You know, I mean, <laughs> you look at the names I played with and Broncos and Alberts and you know, I mean, the players are just were unbelievable. Uh, you know, I mean, it was a lucky, I was lucky, lucky, lucky boy to be able to play with these guys. So it was a great time, man. It was a great time. 
Yeah. Great days, great days. <laughs> do you um do you have you talk talk us through um playing in an old firm game, Peter? How was that when you first got there? Obviously, you said your father to 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 see Rangers or at least showed you or made them made made them aware made you aware of them. But how big was the old firm? Explain to you who was it? Was it ended it to pull you aside when you first got there to go right? This is a down. This is what happens in these games. Um, it wasn't really um, like yeah. Of course, players you know on the pitch you know building up to the game like the Arthur Newmans and Barrys and, and Alberts for example as well was a big one as well. He I you mean know, they were trying to talk to you and help you through it. But I remember my first old firm experience was a terrible one. You know I mean we, the one we lost six two at Parkhead. Um, oh. It was, uh, and I was. <laughs> I remember it though that we were three 0 down after about twenty minutes, and then yeah, uh, I, I was a twelve minute. I have a guy tells me to go and warm up, so I was actually <laughs> warming up the whole game, whole game, like whole first half. After that, they went three 0 up. We, I was out warming up till half time, a little bit as well. I got the last five minutes. Every time he kept sending players down, warming up next to me and putting it all in front of me, I warmed literally up the whole game. I had knee exercise doing it, and I was literally just stretching and looking around and no idea what to do. Um, but it was quite a surreal experience and a terrible one because of the result uh, as well. Um, uh, we should have had a goal to go back to three each as well. They got disallowed. We shouldn't have been disallowed. It could have changed the game, but it didn't, and we went on to lose 6-2. But, and of course, enough about that. Enough about that. <laughs> we got back oh, home, on, a, home though. There's a pizza I think Gredo is getting good. a pizza delivered. <laughs> what, was your dress, what was your dressing room like after that defeat, Peter? Ah, it was it was horrible, you know. I mean, it was, it was pure down. I was a young boy as well, I was 20 years old, you know. When you're sitting in there, and it was it was a hard one to 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 take. But you're kind of not, I'm not saying anything. I'm sitting in there, new to this place, and you don't know really what to do. And it's more the experienced players who's it was vocal and the coaches and managers and that was speaking and um, it was just a really down, you know. That's the, when you go to something like that and lose 6-2, is, is, that's a hard one to take and, you know, I mean, everybody's going to feel that and we did, definitely did. The dressing was, was not good, so. How did how uh, did it compare to the, the North East Derby down in England? Uh, a lot, I've been asked that everywhere I've been, you know, I mean, I've going to Schalke and Dortmund, Schalke is massive derby as well and, and going to then the Newcastle Sunderland is, did nothing compared to the old firm, you know. Everybody thinks, oh, just as big and all the rest of it, but uh, not, you know. I mean, there's not even. But I would say Newcastle, uh, Sunderland is closest uh, the ones I've experienced. Um, that that's a that's a big rivalry as well, really big. But um, I'll still say old firm is still ahead. My say. Definitely. Well, I was uh, just saying there, Grado, about uh, the the similarities between the North East derby and the old firm game, and Peter was saying that. Yeah, the old firm game blows it out of the water, but that's a oh, I yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. It was it was I was watching Sunderland till I die last night. Um, have, you, have you caught that, Peter? I've seen, it. I've seen the first season, and I'm actually just starting the second season. Even though oh, Newcastle, love man, it. And I mean, I I I just love their programs. They're the same on the Amazon. I love all the all or nothing programs that are the sports for my coaching oh. development as well. I watch all these programs, and it's really good. So to get an insight like that. I when you go? No, I say I just like watching it. Uh, I'd love these. Oh, programs the great documentaries, Peter. Yeah. The, the the Man City one's great, but I like the Sunderland one just because uh, the, 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 it just shows you the way that club was run. And yeah. I've got to admit, the star of season one was Martin Bain. He was like David Brent, <laughs> and every season would have a different Rolex. What was he like to deal with personally, Peter? Uh, Oh, that had man been that Rangers. He was the one when I signed. You know, that was that was there. But you know, I, I didn't really have much contact with him. And you spoke with him, and you, you seen him at the training ground and or the stadium or whatever it was. But it was not. I didn't really have personal time to deal with him in any way like that because it was more my agent. If there was any contract talks, it was him. And um, so I didn't really have a have a chat with him in, in many ways like that. But he was okay with me. So never went for a never went for a couple of sunbed sessions with him or anything like that. No. <laughs> I had my own session going with my tan back then. I was absolutely flying my own tan. <laughs> well, she, 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 she getting, getting to that point, right? That's a true story. I went to, I went to college with Alassie, right? And she was a Celtic supporter. And then when you signed for Rangers, 
she fancied you that much that she's a Ranger supporter now. Ah, <laughs> uh, see, see. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a true story, by the way. Support Rangers now. Now she supports Rangers reserves because he's a manager. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that is a great that is a great job for you, Peter. You're you're, you're back at the club that you love, uh, doing the reserve stuff. Is that, um, I mean, how how did that come about? Be, be getting the reserve gig. Um, it was actually quite interesting because I was I got a phone call from Stuart Robinson who actually wanted me to go and speak to Pedro about the assistant job for Pedro Casinha. Um, oh, one, Jonathan Johansson, go that one. Yes. And, uh, so we all went for interviews for that. I was there and, and that as well. But it is uh, Craig apparently heard about my interview with uh, with the uh, Kashinia and really liked it and wanted to speak to him himself. Um, and at that point, I was doing a lot of TV stuff, like commentating and stuff for games. Um, so he asked me to come in and have a chat with him. So I came in and he just said that he wants me to start see if what was interesting starting with the 15s. But at that point, to be fair, I was. I, I couldn't see myself coaching at the, the younger boys at 15s. We, I, I thought I would struggle with that um, with, the, with the younger kids, but um, I actually thought, no, I'll give it a chance and see how it goes. And it was mostly night trainings and that three times a week. And um, I just I could still do my commentating things at the same time. And so I just to give it a go, and I actually loved it. Um, and quite quickly. I got moved up and helped with the 16s, and then quickly after that, I, I helped a little bit with the 18s. But then it was really, I was only thinking a year and a half, a year and a bit. Uh, I was in there, and I got moved up and part of the reserve squad. Um, and that was me and Billy Kirkwood. When Graham Murphy got moved up to the first team, it was kind of us uh, who was who was uh, doing the the reserve, and then Billy Kirkwood then been moved up to to the loan players, uh, the first team. So. Um, that kind of mean that I got it. I've been in there, so I've been in there quite a while now, and it actually quite quickly came from 15s all the way up to the reserves. So uh, that was quite good. I've got to admit, you are probably my favourite uh, co-commentator. We wee Tom up the booth. <laughs> you're a good Jerry the King Law, mate. You're you're good at you're good at what you do. You're good at um, uh, playing that part in the commentary team. Do you still get to do that now and again? I try to. Tom keeps trying to get me on, but it's difficult with my scheduling because we're traveling so much, especially with the serves and the new program we're doing. Because we're not in the league anymore, we're doing uh, like a traveling program. So we go around playing games abroad and all that. And most of the times, we're actually I'm away doing the same games at the time where the first team is. So it's been so difficult to get me on again since I've been a while. But we've actually been trying. I've always been close a couple of times again, but just because of my schedule, I hadn't been able to do it. Um, but whenever it opens up and I don't have a game, I'll be back on again, yeah. Ah, you're good at it, mate. You're really good. No, oh, it's brilliant. I love it. I love doing it. But that's because you don't need to be biased. You know what I mean? You can say what you want. I literally just watch as a fan. You can just go mental. <laughs> <laughs> as, uh, you can go mental when you score. That's brilliant. <laughs> I've got to be honest with you. Rangers TV commentary holds a good place in my heart and all for quite a, for quite a few reasons. I bet. <laughs> hey, I'll just ignore him. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, is that the favourite I'm, line, Tom? I'm doing, I'm doing the Jerry King Lawler part now. All right, give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, can you see yourself? Which day you, you, you want to be the Rangers manager one day? Um, oh, I want to be a manager for definite. Um, I want to be my own manager. Um, and of course, Rangers. I would never say I, I would never turn that job down in a million years. Um, but. It's too far for me to look for right now. Uh, I would never sit and look at myself going, oh, I want to be a Rangers manager now. I got a lot to learn still and I need to develop um, as a manager. And um, of course, if something happened and I had to go in and be whatever it was, if it was a caretaker, whatever it was, I would never turn that down and I would go and do the best that I could to my abilities um, and hopefully develop in the job. But um, I would definitely want to be a manager, but I don't know if Rangers would be the first one. But hopefully down the line, it will be definitely one of them. So what about, you, say, say you get promoted tomorrow, right? They give you the Rangers manager's job tomorrow. Right. What, one of the, what one of the younger players that you currently play on the reserves team would make the step up? Who would you, who would you take with you into the first team squad? Um, that's, to be fair, there's a few boys that's doing really well, but the two guys right now that I, I, for me is doing extremely well and deserve, I think Nathan Patterson, they're right back. He is, uh, he's developing extremely well, uh, physical as well, um, and he's close with that. I think he's actually getting up to the first-team squad anytime soon. So 
um, he'll be one. And I think Kai Kennedy as well, our, our front player, he's he's been unbelievable for us, uh, for the reserve team. There's been lots of players been good, but he's been really special for us as well. And these two are probably the ones that will be that's closer to the first team at the moment. Um, but hopefully there'll be a lot more to come. Patterson's got to be a right back for years to come, I think, can't he? Yeah, he, he reminds me so much of Alan Hutton. Uh, aye, aye. Way, as Alan Hutton does, he's shaped the same way. He's pure, athletic, tall, and has that dynamic that Alan Hutton has to. And uh, um, that I, I can definitely see him down the line being being the Rangers with uh, Rangers right back at one point. That's exciting, Peter. Yeah, it is definitely. Yeah. What a job! Just in there with a the young, just that's a great job. <laughs> it is a good job. Yeah, seeing the good. seeing the future of the club coming through, man. Probably. Yeah, that's good. But it's also pressure, you know, we want to get them through. I mean, that's what it's all about. It's not about for us, it's not so much, yes, you want to win every game as a Rangers uh, player and as a Rangers coach, but for us, it's trying to get these first team players, you know, I mean, we need to get these young boys up to the first team, and that's the main problem. And that's the main objective of what us is to do that, is trying to push as many forwards as we can up to the first team to help the first team out. How about how is your, your, your communication with Stevie G, Peter? Is it, um, is it daily? Is it. Do you meet up with him every every other couple of days just to kind of brief him on what's happening? Is it a, a good relationship you've got there with the man? No, we got a huge respect for each other. We have got a good relationship that way, and we we speak when we see each other in corridors and, and when there's meetings and stuff like that. But you know, I mean, he's got so much on his plate. I'm not gonna text him every day and ask him things and you know, these type of way. You know, you need to let the man be, and he has so much pressure on him to to do a job for Rangers. So that's what we need to do. So. You just leave him to do do these things, but I, I communicate a lot with Michael Beale as well, and um, he's he's been fantastic for me as well and for us as well. Um, the communication between the first team and the reserves. So, um, but of course we also we got staff games. We play staff games in grand closed doors. We haven't had one for a while, of course, because of all this. But also before that, but that that's normally hilarious and brilliant, and we have a good laugh for doing that. Oh, so he's all playing. Yeah, so we all play. So we like uh, the manager and Michael Beale and McAllister at times, and then me, Kevin Thompson. Now he's no. <laughs> Look at Bob's face. Look at Bob's face, I man. You're you're buzzing, aren't you? Ah, it's brilliant. And there's me. There's an opportunity for me to be uh, to play with Stephen Gerrard as well. I'm buzzing. The need to show that old range of teeth. Ah, but we're playing. We're playing against uh, Russell Kerry, the hairdresser. He's a uh, he's he's got a team. Actual, uh, Russell Kerry, he's got he's a hairdresser. He's got an actual like a uh, amateur team. There, and we play against them. So they come in um, because he cut Russell cuts everybody's hairs in the club and all the first team and players and all that. So they come in and we play them. It's hilarious, you know. What I mean, they they are actually in the beginning they were a wee bit standoffish at times because of the the, the manager and uh, and me and they didn't want to tackle us. But now they they get writing about it and it's proper the proper competitive. So it's. Uh, that's it's brilliant. quite funny, yeah. I think we've not, we not lost. I've not lost a game. We've not lost him yet, I think. But it's That's still. Quite, I, listen, see, be honest with you, Peter. Use your ex pro football. See if you're losing a game to a bunch of hairdressers or something for a fucking. <laughs> <laughs> it's only one of them. It's not all of them. It's just one of the guys' hairdressers. <laughs> he just runs the show. He's the manager of the team, plus he's the, stri- the striker for them. But that's it. <laughs> the football daft team should get a wee team together, man. We should go out and play them. Uh, uh, we'll play. Ah, we that forward, eh? we can put that forward. You need to get a lot more bodies, though. <laughs> John. Uh, I mean, if a couple of, if a couple of barbers can get the show, we can get in. Come on. You know, no wrestling moves, mate. You can't, you can't say two players like that for. I put them in a tombstone or something like that. <laughs> you know, you know, <laughs> let me be great, but that's all I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you know, see like, that bit in Sonic the Hedgehog where he rolls up into a ball and flies at people? That would be me. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, that, I must admit, I remember uh, playing in that charity game that we both done as well, and I remember you coming up to me and talk to me about, talking to me about Brett Hart, man, and it just filled my heart with love, man. I was like, wow, oh. Peter loving kind of the wrestling. Oh, I loved it. I uh, grew up with wrestling. Brett Hart and was massive for me. I was the guy I was in, and in The Rock, of course, was the ones, but uh, I love Ultimate Warrior as well, and The Undertaker. They were my guys that I was a big into, but Brett Hart was number one. Are you going to watch WrestleMania this weekend, my man? It's WrestleMania behind closed doors this weekend. I've seen that, but I have to be fair, to be brutally honest, I've not seen it for years and years, but um, I used to be massive into it when I was younger, yeah. Well, you know that there's uh, the, the guy that's, that's fighting for the heavyweight title, he's Scottish, 
Drew McIntyre's his name is, and he's a big, big Rangers fan, so he is. He was I actually meant to do the... It's bad. He's what? He follows me on social media, so yeah, I know. Aye, aye, aye. He meant to do the half-time draw against... Um, who were we playing two weeks ago, the German team? Uh, Lever- Lever- was it? Uh, Lever- yeah. Aye, he, he was supposed to do the half-time draw, but... That was the day that they put the ban on all travel to America and shit, so he had to fly back, man, so he was absolutely devastated. Oh, nah, hopefully we'll get him on. And and then. Aye, aye, we would, we'd be good. So tell us a wee bit more about your time at Newcastle. Peter, that interests me. Um, I, I have to say, I, I absolutely loved every every part of that. My four years in Newcastle was amazing. Yeah, I had some lows because my dad passed away when I was halfway through the season in, in the championship. But from mm. then on, it just it just kicked on, and it was I just also outside of football, the, the way we kind of socialised uh, my wife and my kids and how we settled in it's in the city was was quite quite amazing, you know. Um, we, I loved every minute of it, um, and really Newcastle got a big part of my heart as well with football because what the fans did for me that night, where I, two days after I lost my dad and I scored. Um, I will never, never forget it and every time I talk about it I still get goosebumps you know because the, 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 I've never heard a roar like that before in my life in a stadium for just for them kind of showing their appreciation to me after I scored you know it was it was quite incredible and, and for that I will always be thankful for them and you know even to this day if you still see sometimes on my social media they still sing my song in Ray for Games that's you know I mean, 10 years ago since I played there like 8 or 9 years ago so and they still sing my song going away games at times, you know, it's just amazing. So they, they got a big part of yeah. my, my football heart as well, yeah. It's an amazing city, Aye. Newcastle. Yeah, I've been there loads and loads of times, man, and you, you don't, you, you feel as if you're in Glasgow a bit. Yeah, it's, it's, that, it's, like, that's it's exactly awesome. how I felt, you know, I felt it being quite the same, except for being, you know, a one, one, uh, one team city kind of thing. That way, that's just show I'm much more passionate. And that way, kind of thing where you don't have the one city hating you and you know, <laughs> like, like you. Uh, but it, it was it was unbelievable, and I loved every minute. And also, my teammates, I don't think I've ever had, and I don't think you will actually get that now in football, a closer relationship with players at the time of the championship that we had in the dressing room. You know, we were hanging out, uh, going for movies, to the cinemas, and for Wagamamas, and for dinners, whatever, but 12 or 13 of us, just regular during the week, and, you know, I mean, just hanging out, you know, I mean, you probably get one or two you would do that with nowadays if it is, but I don't think you ever see a group like that. We were so close doing golf days and whatever it was, we were just all hanging out and having a great time. Um, and I just, I think it also just showed on the pitch when we done so well in the championship was kind of part of that. I think we've been so close as a team. Mm-hmm. It definitely shows that you know a, a team that hang about together and you know spend a lot of time with each other. It does boost the morale and it, it does help the team on the pitch, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Do you know what? I- do you, do you know what I can always remember when you playing for Newcastle? It felt like every transfer window we were always going to try and re-sign you. Was there ever any whispers of you coming back to Rangers at that point? Um, no, there was there was always talks, and I always heard that there was talks about it. Um, there was a lot of talks about me going back every time there was a transfer window. I, I kept getting linked to coming back, um, but no, there wasn't there, there there wasn't any truth in it at any point. Um, of it wasn't close at any point for me to come back. It wasn't until I kind of stopped and we were, we were, I was almost finished my after Birmingham. Um, I went back to train with Rangers for a couple of days, but it wasn't because I was signing. It was just because uh, Fernando Rickson's game, the testimonial at Ibrox were coming up and Aye. I trained with him for a wee while and I had a, I had a chat with Kenny McDowell. But at that point, um, Alan McCoy just put on garden leave and it was Kenny McDowell was then in charge and it was a bit of a turmoil kind of thing. And that, it was probably the closest I've been at that point, but... It never kind of came around and it never happened in any way. It was just, uh, I just kind of kept myself fit for two weeks to play the game and that was kind of it. That was the closest I've probably been to be back. When you played... I always felt as if... Sorry, Bob, when you go... When you played in England, everybody always goes on about the Championship being such a difficult league and you won the promotion that year. How hard was that league? Uh, it is it is extremely hard. Um, it's so tough because of the amount of games there is as well. Um, you play a lot more. Um, it's a lot you more. Play time. basically every midweek, don't you? Yeah, uh, exactly. It's that a Tuesday or Sunday, Wednesdays type of thing all the time, and you know it's it's really tough. And you need a big squad. You need a you need to play a lot as well. You need to have a, a squad that can keep themselves fat. You know that you don't have many injuries, and if you do, you need people to step up. And 
we, we just had a really good squad. To be fair, though, if you look at our squad that went down from the Premier League to come to be in a championship, we had a lot of pressure on us as well to actually go back up again because of the, the oh, kind of players we managed to keep and the, the wage bill and the rest of it that probably would have been as well. So it was it was uh, it was a lot of pressure, um, but we, we we stood up to it, and I think um, we were just relentless. You know, getting 102 points is not many teams goes over 100 points in the championship, and we got 102. You know, it shows. I think we lost two games the whole season, and you know, we were we were we were just strong and relentless and kept pushing through. And um, it was it was great to be part of. To be fair, great to be part of that type of type of thing to experience as well. Mm-hmm. 102 points in the championship. That's feet. I know, I know. It's uh, that's quite quite impressive. Um, but <laughs> I remember I, I was actually going into the last game of the season. We had a 99 points against QPR away, uh, and I was on the bench and they put me on and I scored in one one nil. And I so I scored the goal that got us 102 points. <laughs> <So> actually, <laughs> that's actually quite brilliant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I was actually. It was, it was, it was, a, it was in Newcastle. It was quite funny with me and Chris shooting because looking back now as a manager, now and myself being a coach and that, um, I had a lot. Me and Chris Shooting was so, we had so much respect for each other and we had such a good relationship. Uh, also, what he did and helped me with my dad. But it was funny though because he only played me, started me at home games. It was I had I had this and I had I had to keep knocking on his door every weekend every week because every time he had an away game I was on the bench and every time I was at home I started and I kept scoring but he didn't start me away from home and I was like how the hell can I score at home every game and you keep me putting me on the bench at away games and he was basically <laughs> because we were playing a more compact not with two up front so me and Andy Cal were up front on a on a home game but he was playing with Kevin Nolan and I said that shadow striker behind him uh, instead so more compact midfield and now as a coach I get it I totally get it it's tactical away from home right. doing it that way but it was frustrating as hell being a player doing well and you couldn't even start an away game and I think he started me mm-hmm. twice away and I scored in both of them in Middlesbrough was one of the like, smaller derby and I scored in that goal game went to home game I scored and then again next away game again I, I, I was on the bench I was like what the hell <laughs> <laughs> but it was it, it was just tactical genius from him in a way and he also had to then try to manage me because how do you manage a player who's doing so well but you kind of play him right. because for the team so you have to I had to accept that it's better for the team that way and that was fine you know and he was so good at managing me with that and, and that's why I got a lot of respect for him and what he had to do because that's no easy and I've been there now myself that it's no easy to do that and he was he was really good at that I, I mean you hope you have played under some really good managers, Pep, your Pardews and Keneals, Shearers. Is there any manager that you can, uh, you mould yourself? You know, you take ideas or stuff that you learnt from managers over the years that you've, you're implementing. What well, they've taught you. I'm that question. I try to ask Yeah, dusty <laughs> bastard. <laughs> <laughs> I actually try and take a wee bit from everybody. I have to be honest. You know, I mean, you take, I take a wee bit for every coach. You know, I mean, there's certain bits that I think the coach that I, I really liked the way he did this. For example, Alan Pardew, I thought was tactical, really good. I really liked working with him, where and also how him and Chris Shooting, both of them, tactically and also their player management was really, really good. So these things I would take from them too, probably. And then Alex McLeish had other things, um, preparation, tactical stuff as well. Morden Olsen, Danish national team coach, you know, I mean, who I was uh, basically, sorry, my language shit scared of, you know, I mean, in a way, he was so intimidating, <laughs> but he was such a good coach, but he was very intimidating. And I didn't I didn't have a good relationship. We had a kind of love-hate relationship um, kind of thing, but a lot I would take from him, but then the stuff you do, you wouldn't. So, you know, I mean, if you're trying to understand, I'm just, I would pick certain things I would probably look at and from each coach and try and implement that into myself and make my, must be myself my own coach. What What's your favourite dinner? Favourite dinner? <laughs> <laughs> so you can answer that first. Advocate, then answer your favourite dinner. Well, advocate, advocate. What was he like? Was he quite scary? Was he quite uh, he, he was called the general, so that pretty much tells you. You know, he was. Uh, he, he was. But you know, like a lot of people would say that because. But for me, I seen a different side of him at, uh, at one point. You know, I mean, he was very intimidating as well he was one of the guys where you know you seen him in the corridor you put your head down you said good morning and you know i mean there was not Aye. you wouldn't have an argument with him in that way but i had a i had a experience with him in in, uh, in florida in pre-season where i've had my first season of rangers if you didn't know I, I pulled my hamstring three times um and i came back to this pre-season and i was so frustrated because of my first season and you want to go and show what you can do and you're so desperate to impress and 
and everybody had put out all oh, the new live drop and all the rest of it. The pressure on me was, re- I-, I felt, was really ridiculous. You know, I mean, I had to c- come out saying, I c- there's no way in hell I can try to be Brian Loudrop. You know, I mean, he's an absolute legend in, in Denmark. And on his own, he's an absolute legend. So he's a role model for me. So uh, I had to deal with that. And I felt that pressure on me. And I kept pushing myself too much and too fast every time I came back from injury. And I kept pulling my hamstring because I wasn't ready. But I was that desperate to get back. Um, and I remember then in Florida, I pulled it again with five minutes to go in a training match. Literally five minutes to go, I pulled it again for the fourth time. And uh, and I remember sitting outside the change room and I was in tears, uh, bets just by myself in a corner. Um, and he came out and he seen me sitting and he came over and he gave me a big cuddle and put his hand around me and kind of said to me, the, you know, when you've got so much time, don't worry about it. You're still young, you know, got plenty of time. And you'll get you right, and all this kind of gave me this encouraging talk, and that was a side to him that a lot of people wouldn't have seen and no one knows about, but I, I kind of got that by, you know, I mean, the situation I was in, and this showed how good he was as kind of also managing players, so I got a really special thing with him with that. Hey, that's a kind of management side that you wouldn't think you'd see for him, it's more kind of disciplining, and more yeah. discipline me advocate, but the man yeah. management side yeah. as well, that's a nice touch. Yeah, it was, it definitely was. And uh, what's no. your favourite dinner? I've been eating some seafood favourite dinner. This bad. It's a Danish dinner. I got. I got. Oh, tell me. Um, it's actually. It's now my wee girl's. My oldest girl. She says her favourite dinner now as well. It's actually. In, I'll pronounce it in Denmark in Danish first, right? And then I'll explain what it well. is. It's called steak flesk or pasilla sauce. Right. Oh, stick fish up a chip of All right, it's a, a stick of fish in a silly sauce. <laughs> but it's actually it's fried pork, so it's pork uh, that's fried and grilled in the in the oven to this proper crispy, and uh, so right. pork belly slices, proper thin slices, and you normally in Denmark you go into the restaurant, you get it, and you can eat as much as you want. So you get a big, big, big plate, and it's lying there, and then potatoes with parsley sauce. So it's big. Oh. It's all in potatoes and parsley sauce to dip into it. Um, and it's basically in the restaurant, you eat as much as you can for like a tenner, 13 pound, and you can eat as much as you want. It's unbelievable. So, it's one of my favourite. So do you, make, do you make it in the house? Yes, I make it in the house. I can buy it. I, I have to buy it in the shop, but I have to slice the slices myself. In Denmark, you can buy it in the supermarkets already sliced, and you just shove them in the oven. But here, they don't because it's not a, a, a dinner you get here. I have to buy the pork belly slices myself and slice them thinner, um, and then get, then cook it. But um, my wee girl, yeah, yeah no, I like this you know. loves it. Right, dinner. so Peter, when are we coming round to try this? <laughs> <laughs> see how? Do you need to give me the link to that? The name of that? I'm going to look that up. I take it you can't. There's there's no spices that you put on it that you can get for IKEA or anything like that. No, is it just you've got to make it yourself? <laughs> IKEA. Oh, IKEA. He's Danish, no Swedish, also. It's very easy to make though. It's very easy. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, it's, 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 it's the Scandinavian bit, you know. I mean, Sweden, Denmark. Even though it's we have a it's, it's still, <laughs> we can do that. I'll let you get me with that question. Sorry? Go. Can I ask one question? Yes. Go. We're in, a, we're in isolation now, obviously. Nobody's going out the house and all that. Yeah. How many times have you watched your winning goal against Celtic in the cup final when you've just been bored in the house? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm right. Okay, let's be, let's be truthfully honest here, right? I've... Not only because we're in isolation, I watched that go all the time, even before. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's not to do with this, this corona stuff, you know what I mean? It's been going on for years. So, uh, it's, uh, uh, Peter, Peter how, how often do you watch your old firm debut? Uh, I've not seen that much. Uh, I, I don't even think I remember when it was now anymore, actually. I, I, I kind of erased that but. But to be fair though, if you remember, if you've seen my wee tweet uh, the other day though, that on Sunday at four past seven, get it taped on the TV, BBC Scotland, the whole fam- the whole cup final is on. Oh, what is already game. done? Aye, it's Barry's coming round. Oh, oh brilliant. The whole game's going, I'm going to be watching. <laughs> I'll be on it. I'll say to my kids and everything that we need to get. <laughs> Aye. We are steak slacker sloth. Take it, 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 take it,
Cheer up cup final. How how terrifying is it playing against Bobo Baldi? To be fair though, I think he was more scared of me than that coming to that bit of Germanic Rosa score again at that point. So, <laughs> <laughs> Aye, Peter, you've been absolutely fantastic. We're going to need to do the quiz now. Who's doing the quiz? Uh, you're dead, Gredo. I'll ask you questions. Right, Andrew. Right, Aye, Bob, you ask your questions, but I, I feel as if you're quite low, mate. I can have the heat, no? Your, your sync quality's low. What's the, what's the quiz about? What's the topics now? It's a footy quiz. It's a what? Just football. Right, so basically, I'll introduce it, right? So every week on Football Daft... We put our football guests on. So every week on Football Daft, we put our football guests, football knowledge to the test with our 90 second quiz, right, Peter? Now, there's a leaderboard, and currently at the top of the leaderboard is Barry Ferguson. Oh, wow. He's got points. The bottom is David McCracken for Falkirk. He's only got one point. He was murder. Alan Archibald, he's second with 11. Ian Murray, he was on last week. He got seven. And Lee Miller, Jordan Young, and Bob Malcolm, they're on six. So, do right. you think you can beat them in particular? So, it's Barry's on 12, Grax is on one, Archibald 11, Murray's on seven, Bob Malcolm, Jordan Young, Lee Miller on six. Surely you can try and beat six anyway. Um, and you've got to give an answer. It, even if it's the wrong answer, you've got to give an answer. Just a quick you fire can. answer. Just a quick one. Yeah. If you can. Okay. Okay. Nay passing, and you've got 90 seconds. Nay passing, <laughs> okay. You ready, mate? <laughs> right. Are you ready, Pete? So, young, young Bob here is going to do the questions. Okay. And if John, the producer, has a time and a clock, we will get firing on. Here we go. Name the current Sheffield United boss. Oh. I can't, I can't remember the name. I can't remember it. Need you an answer? <laughs> I bet, um... John Marshall, I don't, know. I don't know. Which which club formed in the nineties won the Scottish Cup in two thousand and fifteen? These are hard. Who was manager of Scotland at the nineteen seventy eight World Cup? Oh, no idea. Uh, Walter Smith. <laughs> Who did you score your first Newcastle hat trick against? Uh, Plymouth. What's Airdrie's nickname? Airdrie's nickname? Um, um, no idea. The, the ship club. No idea. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the current number nine for Rangers? Uh, Jermaine Defoe. Queen of the South playing which Scottish town? No idea. Um, no idea. How many caps did you get for Denmark? Uh, 22. Manager of Air United. Oh, uh, you know, um, uh, I don't know. In what year did Rangers last win the Premiership? Oh, that would have been uh, 2009. Time. Time's up, Peter. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh, oh, no. <laughs> well, I've got all the answers here. You did all right, Peter. You did okay. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Two. Let's run four, I think. Well, we'll run through the wrong answers. The current Sheffield United boss is Chris Wilder. The club that were formed in the 90s and uh, won the Scottish Cup in 2015, that was Inverness Cali Thistle. Uh, Ali McLeod managed the Scotland team in 1978. Uh, Airdrie's nickname's not the shit club, it's the Diamonds. <laughs> said shit, not shit. Shit <laughs> club, all right, okay. Uh, Queen of the South play in Dumfries. Uh, yeah. Club Air United manager is Mark Kerr. And Rangers last won the in 2011 so you're not bottom of the leaderboard but you're not far off it you scored three uh, I bet you wanted two I thought that's alright <laughs> that was that was well done mate no it was <laughs> <laughs> that's pure light that's pure light <laughs> brilliant <laughs> Peter questions were harder than the ones that we've had in previous that was a hard one to add I, I agree with you mate that was really hard going that man, right 
Peter, we're going to need to wrap this up, mate. Is there anything you want to tell your fans? Um, no, just stay safe. Stay home and stay safe. You know, that's, that's what it's all about. You know, stay home and uh, save lives. So that's what we need to do at the moment. So as long as everybody's okay and safe, that's, that's all I'm asking right. me at the moment. So. Right, that's great words from the great Peter Lovenkranz, a hero. Audio Frontier.